We're talking about the patterns of life that we can all see around us, of which we are all a part, whether or not we recognize the pattern that we are currently living out. But the purpose of this series is to contrast the pattern of this world with God's pattern for life. Basically, the values and attitudes and behaviors of our culture to which every one of us is being uh, pressured to conform, contrasted with God's pattern for life and his desire for us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We started last week with this series looking at that word transform. It's the Greek word, anybody remember? Metamorphosis. It's the Greek word metamorphosis, which is a perfect picture of God's heart for us, this miraculous transformation that you see in the journey of a caterpillar to a butterfly. It's God's way of saying, I made you, but I, I, I have such in store for you. You have so much potential, and I want you to be metamorphosized. I want you to be transformed, not conformed to what you see going on around you, but genuinely, deeply transformed. But the Bible says the only way we can be transformed is by the renewing of our minds. As I said last week, you, you can't be transformed unless you're first informed. You have to know God's pattern for life so that your thinking can change. And especially as you see the contrast to the pattern of the world and you go, wow, this is better, <laughs> right? I want this more for myself. That is when God begins this process of transformation, starting with us being aware of God's pattern, why we're here on this earth, who we're called to be. And so that's the goal of the series is to know God's pattern, but to experience it for ourselves. We're not trying to just teach information and say, hey, here's God's pattern. What we're aiming for is what the Bible calls his good and pleasing and perfect will. Amen? Do you agree with that? That's what we want, all of us. And so we're focusing uh, primarily in the book of Proverbs for these weeks, which are filled with the wisdom of God's pattern for life. And I love this book of Proverbs for many reasons, but one of them is it's not just a definition of wisdom. It's not an academic study. This is how wisdom is defined. It is rather a series of patterns. This is what wisdom looks like in all of these different areas of life. Like, how do I deal with conflict? And by the way, not just avoiding conflict. Conflict is a part of life. How do I move through conflict productively in a way that honors God and maintains relationship? We're going to be talking about relationships as the canvas primarily where we see God's pattern painted in life and played out in life. We're going to be talking about money and possessions and envy and contentment. What do we do with everything that God has given to us? So this is just some of the content of the Proverbs that's coming. But before we get into that content, these first two weeks, the purpose of it is a bit of an introduction. What is wisdom? The foundation of wisdom. Not only what is wisdom... But today we're going to be talking about how do we get wisdom, and I think the most important question, why should I want it? Because that's like underneath all of this. If it doesn't have value for me, this is a waste of time, or it's just information, and I move back to my life as it was, right? So today we're going to be continuing this conversation of the foundation of wisdom, but before we get into this morning, in case you were not here with us, I think it's important to quickly review the three foundational uh, mindsets, practices of wisdom that we talked about last week. The first one is learning to listen. This is like step one in becoming a wise person. Learn to listen in a culture that is addicted to arguing, in a culture where, where news outlets thrive on polarized perspectives. I was just talking with a friend the other day, why can't they just get the facts? Well, because facts don't sell. Right? You have to have polarized perspectives. You can't really just get people at the table and say, here's the perspectives. You make up your mind. Our, our culture is not suited for that. It doesn't honor that. It doesn't reward that. And so God's pattern, rather than this arguing and talking and fighting, is admitting, I don't know everything. It's humility. It's saying, I have a lot to learn from you, friend, even if we disagree. And I would say probably especially if we disagree. That's the hard part. So learning to listen. Number two, the second one we talked about last week is recognizing limits. This is one of the most fascinating parts about the Proverbs is that wisdom is described as being there at God's side at creation and is called the architect of creation. Proverbs chapter 8, if you want to read that later. The architect and the role of wisdom at creation was what we talked about last week? Establishing limits. 
Basically saying, okay, uh, son, you do your thing. This is your course. You stay on that course, okay? And sea, oceans, here's your boundary. You don't cross that. And horizon, here's the difference between the land and the sky. There's a line. There's a division. That was wisdom's role in creation. And we would all agree that the limits that God has built into creation are good, right? It's good that the sun stays on its course, amen? It's good that the ocean generally stays <laughs> behind its boundaries. That's another conversation, another sermon, right? Um, but we also have to realize wisdom gives you and me limits. We're part of creation. It's given us limits, and these limits are intended not to restrict us, but to give us freedom. Now, if you just take that statement, that sounds contradictory, that limits bring freedom. That's certainly not what the pattern of our world would say about the limits God has given. They would say, no, 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 those are restrictive, therefore we throw them off and do whatever we want, right? Pattern of the world. But I want to share an example from my life recently, maybe not recently, but my life in the last 10 years or so, where a limit brought freedom. And it's in the area of budgeting. <laughs> there was a time when uh, my wife and I, our family, had no budget. And the reason was I had this idea in my head that that would restrict us. That I would have this limit placed on what I could spend, where I could spend it. And it was way easier to just spend. Anybody? Okay, nobody's, well, just few, a few honest people. No, I'm kidding. But what, what ended up happening, though, if I was honest with this pattern that I had built into my life is... I, you know, if I wanted to go to dinner with my family, I would just go to dinner. And I would cross my fingers and hope that I made it by the end of the month and I had money for bills. Now, was that freedom? That's not, that's not freedom. But as soon as we started a budget and, for example, said, okay, this $100 is for this purpose. Here's the beauty. And 100% of that $100 can be used for that purpose. And I'm not worrying about whether or not those other purposes are going to be met or fulfilled, right? Because I have limits, I have boundaries, and I have total freedom within those boundaries to do whatever I want. Does that make sense? Yes. It's just a, an example of how the world will see God's limits as restrictive. He's trying to restrict your life, and God's like, no, I want you to be able to play right up to the fence line, right? right. Wisdom comes when we learn to listen, when we recognize our limits, and finally, when we take God seriously, which is what the Bible calls the fear of the Lord. Having a healthy reverence and awe and respect for who God is and what he says and responding to him with reverence. A friend reminded me this past week, we were actually riding bikes, and he said, reminded me of the verse in Psalm 139 that says that we are fearfully and wonderfully made by God. And he was like, what does it mean that God fearfully made you? I was like, ooh. And I said, if I use this in the sermon, I'm going to give you credit. And he said, don't. So I'm not going to. But um, it means that when God makes us, there is a healthy reverence for the complexity and the beauty and the individuality that makes you who you are. God fearfully made you. And so when we hear about the fear of the Lord... Thinking about it simplistically, it's simply reciprocating that back to God. The same reverence and the awe when we see God, when we learn of his character, his word, his power, what he's able to do and sustain, there should be some fear, friends. And I know I was just convicted actually this week of how I tend to downplay fear and I try to bring God down as this person to whom we can relate. He is because of who he is, but he is fearful. And he is awesome. And he could just say a word and all of this goes away. That should cause something to happen in us. And I think that's the idea behind the fear of the Lord. And Proverbs 1 says the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. Meaning you don't experience wisdom for your life apart from him. He is the one who promises I will be with you. I will guide you into all truth. And as we're going to see this morning, it is from his mouth that we find and we receive knowledge and understanding. So the, to the extent that we're near him and we fear him, we grow in wisdom. So with that, we're going to move now into this week um, past the foundation of wisdom and the question of what is wisdom. We're going to talk this morning about how do I get wisdom and why should I want it? 
How do I get wisdom, and what is the practical value of wisdom in my life? Proverbs chapter 2 is where I'd like to have you turn. You may notice last week we started in Proverbs 1, and we focused on the first six verses. This week we are in Proverbs chapter 2, and we are going to focus primarily on the first six verses of this second chapter. How do we get wisdom? Why should we want it? Um, as, we, as you're turning there, let's, uh, let's pray. <laughs> Lord, we recognize that you are um, the beginning of wisdom. From you come knowledge and understanding. And so we ask this morning, um, God, by your spirit, that you'd lift up the light of your face upon us. That each one here today would hear from you. That understanding would come from your mouth and that you would give us ears to listen and to learn the limits that you've established for our good and that we would see you and fear you and revere you this morning. Amen. Proverbs chapter 2, and let's read verses 1 through 6. And by the way, if you don't have a Bible, we normally have Bibles in the back, uh, back uh, see backs? What am I trying to say? Uh, and we'll eventually put them back there, but um, for now you can follow along on the screen or find another option on your phone or something like that. But Proverbs 2 verses, uh, verses 1 through 6 says this, my son, this is Solomon writing to his son and also by God's inspiration to all of us. My son, if you receive my words and treasure up my commands within you, and if you make your ear attentive to wisdom and incline your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So we're going to stop there for a second. Again, the focus of our pursuit is the Lord. From the Lord comes wisdom and understanding. It's not wise sayings. I'm not trying to learn something so that I can be more clever in church. It's not even knowledge of the Bible which I know there's some Christian cultures that would say, well, that's blasphemy. The focus is the Lord. He is the focus because he is the source of wisdom, of life, of joy, of all of it. And what we find in these first six verses is a clear answer to the question of how do I get wisdom? Because last week we looked, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Great. But how do I understand the fear of the Lord? What's that mean? That seems like a big task. Well, he tells us here. He says, if you receive my words... If you treasure up my commands, if you basically, if you tune in, if you incline your heart, if you call out, if you seek, then you will, what? Understand the fear of the Lord. And what is the fear of the Lord? The beginning of wisdom. So what we have here is a clear path to wisdom, but not necessarily an easy path. What I mean by this is, according to these verses, wisdom isn't just going to fall into your lap. You're not just going to accidentally stumble upon wisdom. And I, this, um, I just said this thought, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that on hold. <laughs> he says, if you receive, there's, there's conditions. If you receive, if you treasure, if you call out, if you seek, if you search, then you will find. Now, I couldn't help but think of Jesus in the New Testament. He says, if, uh, ask, and you will receive. Yeah, seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. That's God's way of saying, I want you all to have. I want you all to find. But you have to ask. You have to seek. You have to knock. And, 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 and even as I say this and we read these verses, it's possible to conclude here that this is the opposite of grace. Because isn't it a gift of God? It's all, it's all a gift of God. So why are there these conditions? If you do this, if you do this and this and this and this and this, then I'll give you wisdom. There's a great quote, though, from a well-known pastor who says that grace is not opposed to efforts, but to earning. You may have heard that before. The idea there is that effort is simply action that we take in response to what God has freely given us. Effort is, is uh, pursuing what God has given us, whereas earning is an attitude. It's thinking that I need to do this and this and this in order for God to be pleased with me. And his approval of me depends on me doing these things for him. That's earning. That's the opposite of grace. But grace says 
No, God approves of you simply because of what Jesus did on the cross, nothing more. And it's because of that unconditional approval that you are now free to invest yourself fully in the pursuit of God and in the pursuit of wisdom. That's effort. So just so we understand the difference, it's simply saying that this is worth something to me. That's what these verses are painting a picture of. I see value in wisdom, so I'm going after it. And I'm sure that you've experienced, and we've experienced in lots of areas of life, the value that we see in something determines the effort we will exert in the pursuit of that thing. Does that make sense? The value we see will determine the effort we exert. So for example, when I go to the gym in my one or two times a year, um, and I see that dude who's sweating it out and he's got four weights on either side and his biceps are bigger than my legs. There's a reason for that. That person is putting forth an amount of effort that I can't even imagine putting into that effort, into that activity rather. But underneath the effort, there's a value. Guaranteed. I don't know what that value would be for each person. It could be self-image. It could be physical fitness. There's something driving that effort. And I think that is the purpose of, of this. When we read these verses, that we have to get out of this mindset that this is a religious checklist God is giving me to do. That if I, okay, hold on. So what does he say? If, if I, listen, okay, good, I'm listening. And if I can get something to happen in my heart, okay, come on, come on, heart. And if I call out, okay, God help. And then if I seek for it, ding, wisdom. This is not a religious checklist. Remember, the the Proverbs are patterns. This is simply a picture. It's a pattern of someone who sees increasing value in wisdom. And that increasing value leads to increased effort pursuing God's pattern for their lives. And something you might notice in this pattern is a progression. I don't know if you noticed this. It's a progression, how I would describe it, is being simply receptive to being proactive. Look at this. It's, it's, at the beginning, I'm, I'm willing to listen, and by the end, I'm actively looking for because of the value I see. So look at verse 1 again, and we'll just take these verbs. If you receive... If you receive my word. So this is like step one in this progression. I'm here. I showed up, right? I'm open. I'm ready to listen. Give me something. And by the way, I'll just say this is good because this is, as we saw last week, the first step in the foundation of wisdom is I'm, I'm, I'm here to listen. I'm open, okay? Bring me something. But then the next statement moves from this sort of just receptiveness to, he says, if you treasure my commands. So, so your ears were engaged, but now there's something happening in your heart. Your heart is waking up. <laughs> Does that make sense? Pointing to value. There's something here for me that I want. Verse 2 repeats, by the way, the ear and the heart part of the progression. But then look at verse 3. If you call out, what part are you now involving in the pursuit of wisdom? Go ahead, say it. Yeah, your mouth, your voice, your words. If you call out, if you raise your voice for understanding, so there's an increasing value. You feel your need to the point where you call out. You raise your voice. You can almost hear desperation in these words because you're no longer waiting for somebody to bring you something. You're asking questions. You're maybe on the way home where you'd normally just be thinking about what's for lunch. You just find yourself verbalize God. Would you make this true of me? God, would you do that work that I heard about this morning in me? There's an increased desire, an increased need. And the thing about calling out, as I was pondering this, we only ask for help when we're out of other options. How many of you have ever gotten lost driving? Okay, and if you don't have a driver's license, how many kids have gotten lost in the grocery store? (laughs) I don't know what trying to find something, right? How many of you are like right away, as soon as you realize you're on the wrong track, you pull over and ask for directions? Okay, there's a couple. Yeah, but you're Montanans, all right. Not many. Um, How many of you drive around for a while, you get a little frustrated, then you're like, fine, here's a gas station, I'll pull over? You'd say, that's probably me, okay. How many of you are like, I'm never asking for directions? I'm literally just gonna drive around and around and around, and I don't care if I don't get there, I'm not stopping to ask for help. Well, Wherever you are on that spectrum, the point is we only ask for directions when we feel like we're out of other options. So we call out, help, 
once I was, I was fishing with my uncle, I was probably 14, and we were on the Gallatin River in Bozeman, and the water wasn't that deep, and, but my feet went out from under me, and I started going down with the water, but I was kind of treading water, and I was yelling, help, help, in my little kid voice. I might have been younger than 14, I'll be honest, <laughs> because to this day, my uncle still makes fun of me. He's like, I knew you were okay, but all I could hear was, hell, hell, hell. I was out of options. And I was like, if somebody doesn't help me, I'm done. So there's this increased desire. And then finally, verse 4, you see the end of this progression. If you seek it like silver, if you search for it as for hidden treasure, if I told you right now that there was a million dollars buried in the front grass out there, how many of you would sit here till the end of my message? right? And if you go dug out there, would you like at 12 go down for an hour lunch break? No, you would dig until you found it. You'd forget about everything else. There's this increased desire. He says, then you'll you'll understand. Then you're going to find the knowledge of God because you've gone from simply being, you know, passively receptive to being proactive in the pursuit of God and the pursuit of wisdom. And I want to point out again and emphasize, these are not hoops God is telling us to jump through as if God is playing hard to get. Because we know God wants every one of us to know him. He wants all of us to be wise. I want you all to know and experience my pattern for your life. The point of these conditions, if, 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 then, is to show us a pattern of someone who really needs wisdom, who really wants God, and as a result, it turns into a priority in their lives. What starts to simply listening turns into a desire, and then desire leads to calling out and then searching, and you're basically orienting your life around this pursuit of God and his wisdom. And I personally love this progression. I find it so helpful because God knows we have hundreds of things pulling at us. From every direction, we have activities and causes and people, and you want to donate a dollar to help the kids of America, and There's always asking of our limited resources, of our energy, of our attention, of our passion, of our time, but the reality is God knows our resources are limited, that despite the demand, we can only pursue so many things, and that's part of wisdom's design, limits. Know your limits. And God is simply pointing to the reality of our limits. He's saying, if you want to experience the full benefit of anything, whether it's wisdom or or skiing or whatever, you have to be willing to make it a priority. And this is personally really hard for me because I just want to make everything a priority. Anybody else? Yeah, that's a great thing. I want that. This summer, I was like, I want to be a great fly fisherman. And then I realized this summer, I don't think I have the time for that right now. It was just like a a kind of a, a sobering moment. I don't have time to give myself to that right now. And at the same time, I want to be the best dad. I want to spend tons of time with with my kids one-on-one. And and we have six kids, so you do the math. And and then I want lots of personal time with my wife. I want an amazing marriage. We connect, we talk, we process about everything going on. And then I also want to be the best pastor where I'm there for everybody's everything. Is it going to happen? No. We have to choose. We have to ask, what is most important to me? What holds the highest value? And so when Solomon says to his son, seek after wisdom like silver. Search for it like hidden treasure. I think he's saying to his young son, you may not know it now, but this is the most valuable thing you can find. It's the most valuable thing you can pursue in your life. Move the other stuff to the side. Give yourself to this. And this progression isn't simply being receptive to becoming proactive. It's, it's, I probably need wisdom too. I want it. That's what's underneath all this is desire. It's, it's hidden treasure to you. How many of you would say you believe that you need vegetables? Your body needs vegetables. Okay. We need to have like some talks about health. Anyway. How many of you say, I need vegetables? My body needs vegetables, probably. Okay, how many of you say, I want vegetables? Hey, nice. Really proud of you guys. Um, usually really different answers though, right? 
The progression is not just about proactiveness, but increased desire. I don't just need wisdom. I want it. I'm going after it. I don't just, I probably should read my Bible. I want to read my Bible because of what God does in my heart during those times. Oh, I, I need to be with God's people. I want to be. I want to be there because of what happens in my heart and my life and how God uses me. See, there's value and value drives proactiveness. I'll share an example. My um, brothers and I used to go backpacking. And more often than not, when we would get done with a long backpacking trip, we were, it's like almost dark. We're almost out to the car. Our feet are tired. We're sore. We're hungry. All you can think about is a cheeseburger and fries. Anybody? Like, what is it about that? I don't know. There's just something that you just start envisioning your favorite meals on the way out. But um, we're almost all the way out. We're just about to the car. And I, I feel like one of us would always say, hey, if you realized right now you left your wallet back at the camp, would you go back? And, you know, it'd always be like, no, no. And this is, by the way, before a bunch of credit cards. This was just wallet and maybe some money. And then we're still like, no, 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 I can buy another wallet. Um, and then the brother would up the ante. What if there's 50 bucks in your wallet? No. You know, and we're talking 10 to 15 miles maybe back in, and it's dark, way dark by the time you get back. Uh, what about 100? What about 500 bucks? What about 1,000? And you can see where this is going. At some point, you'd go, okay, I would go back. Because the value increased. It's now worth it to me. It's worth the pain. It's worth not getting to go have that cheeseburger right now. See, we all make decisions based on the value that something holds for us. And so the first six verses of this chapter talk about how do I get wisdom, which I would say the answer to that is how personally involved are you in the pursuit of wisdom? I think that's a good answer to that question. Is it just your ears? Is there ears in your heart? Are you calling out? Is there anything else going on besides Sunday morning? You see where we're going with this? If you want to find wisdom, you have to invest yourself in the pursuit of wisdom. That's what he's saying. How proactive are you being? But here's the thing. In order to be more proactive, you have to see the value of wisdom. So that's why the second half of this morning I'm really uh, excited for and is so important. The last question is, why should I want wisdom? Why should we want wisdom? What is the practical value of it in my life? And the answer to this, it's so wonderful because Solomon, after urging his son, son, pursue wisdom, give up. Give up all the other stuff. I know that you've got a lot of stuff. You've got these dreams for your life. Make this priority. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. After telling his son and giving him this pep talk, he goes on in the rest of the chapter to talk to his son about the value of wisdom. So that's what I want to do for a few minutes is look at the rest of this chapter, little snippets of it, and three benefits of wisdom that I find here. And honestly, as I was preparing this, I, I, was, I felt hesitation. And I was like, why do I feel hesitant to even include this? Here's why I think why I was hesitant to include this, because the point isn't to describe the benefits of wisdom. The point isn't to take notes and say, now I know the benefits of wisdom, as if you could stand up and describe your favorite meal to a crowd, and by the end, they know what your experience was like. The point of this isn't, uh, wisdom isn't something we understand, it's someone we experience. Is the knowledge of God, verse 5 or 6. It's from his mouth that comes understanding. So it's to experience personally the God who gives these benefits. So there's a bit of a disclaimer before we get into this. Verse 7 is the first benefit. Right after urging his son, pursue it with everything you have. He says, God stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield for those who walk in integrity guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. If you're taking notes, the first benefit is God's protection. It says he is a shield for you. He guards your path. He watches over your way. I was thinking this week how God is always watching over his way. That's what it's saying here. He's watching over justice and he's watching over integrity. That's his way. So when your way aligns with his way, what does it mean? He's watching over your way because he watches over his way. Sorry, I'm running in circles around myself. But the point is when we embrace God's pattern for our lives, we experience his protection in our lives. Psalm 4, David writes, In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, keep me safe. This was a guy who had his enemies chasing him through the wilderness who would literally cut his throat while he was sleeping. And he says this, 
I can lie down and dream and sleep deeply because why? I know God is with me. God is the one who keeps me safe. Now, obviously, this doesn't mean we won't experience difficulty, right? That you won't experience trial or rejection, but at the end of the day, you know you have him. And he's the one who meets all of your needs, not just in this short life, but forever. He keeps me safe. Verse 11 goes on with this benefit of protection, if you want to follow along. Discretion, he says, will watch over you. Understanding will guard you. Verse 12, delivering you. The question is from what? From the way of evil, from men of perverted speech who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil. Verse 15, men whose paths are crooked. Now, I'm not about pointing fingers and saying, oh, those people, that's the talking about these and not me, but this is the pattern of our world. It's, it's that things that are right have been branded as wrong, as evil, and that perverseness is being celebrated. That's what he says. Solomon says, wisdom will protect you from going down that crooked path. And the big question is, what's so bad about that path? It seems like the world is doing just fine on that path, aren't they? The answer is, where does that path lead? Verse 16, Solomon begins warning his son to watch out for the forbidden woman. Now, recognize the context here. He's writing to his son. And this was a huge issue and still is for men especially. The forbidden woman, the allure of the forbidden. But I think this is also a metaphor for those who say, well, I can't really relate to being allured by a forbidden woman. It's a metaphor for the enticement to cross the limits God's established for our good. To say, hey, this is a limit. It's a boundary. Don't go there. It's for your good. It's because I love you. And we say, I don't trust you. I actually think I go. So it may be money. It may be something else in your life where you say, I don't care what God's word says about that. It feels good and I'm doing it. And he says, look at what happens in verse 16 when we cross those limits which is what God's trying to protect us from. He says, verse 16, you will be delivered because of wisdom in your life from the forbidden woman, from the adulteress with her smooth words, who forsakes the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant of her God. For her house, listen to verse 18, her house sinks down to death and her paths to the grave. None who go to her come back, nor do they regain the paths of life. Now, again, I think it would be easy to write this off if you don't relate to the adultery thing. Or to say, I'm not married, or that's just, that's just never been a temptation of mine. But I believe, again, this is a metaphor for the many paths that this world has carved out that make up the pattern of this world. Paths that have the appearance of life. They're smooth. They have the appearance of fulfillment, the appearance of joy, but end in destruction and disappointment and death. And Solomon is saying, you will be protected. And God is saying, I want to protect you from these paths, which you're not going to even recognize unless you have my wisdom to go, hold on a second. That seems right, but I know it's not, as our minds are renewed. Well, speaking of fulfillment and joy, that's the next benefit. Number two, verse, verses 9 and 10, if you want to look at there. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity and every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. So when I read every good path in verse 9, I immediately think good is a reference to moral rightness. Every correct path. And I thought, is that what that means? The word does not mean that. The word means pleasing, joyful, beneficial, and happy. Every happy path. He's saying wisdom is going to lead you to every happy path, every way that maximizes your joy, your fulfillment. You're going to understand that. And so the second benefit, write it down, is what I'll call simply pleasure. Now, I grew up in the church where it seemed as if pleasure is incompatible with righteousness. That, that, that the more godly you were, the less pleasure you were supposed to enjoy. Anybody? You don't have to admit that. 
But the idea for me growing up, you can't walk with God and be a person who experiences lots of pleasure. But I think it's because of what the world has done to pleasure. So let me, let me ask you this. Who created pleasure? All right. Who made endorphins so that you feel good? Who filled this world with so much beauty that we are not only practically provided for in the utilitarian sense, but we are extravagantly overwhelmed by beauty to satisfy our senses? God. God is the one who made this. It was God's idea. Pleasure is something God loves. The problem is, pleasure has also been hijacked by our world as something to be pursued apart from God. Apart from his presence. Apart from the worship of him for the gift of pleasure, which turns pleasure into this short-term, shallow solution to a deep problem. And so we go looking for pleasure, and we go, well, that didn't work. Well, that didn't work. The problem is God's the only one who can satisfy us on the level that we want to be satisfied. Look again at verse 10. Wisdom will come into your heart, and knowledge will be pleasant to your what? Soul. I realize we can find pleasure apart from God. We do it every day. Our world does it every day. We can find pleasure for our taste buds. We can find pleasure for our stomachs, for our eyes, for our ears, for our mind, for our emotions, for every part of us except for our soul. The one thing we cannot find pleasure for apart from God is our soul. And that is the deep, aching longing that every person has to be connected to the one who made them. And that's what drives us in the pursuit of pleasure. That's what drives us from relationship to relationship, even though there's wreckage in our wake. Because we're looking and we're saying, I, I, I know that was, that was pleasurable, but it's not what I need. It's not what I was hoping for. It is that soul deep satisfaction. And God says, if you receive my words... <laughs> If you treasure my commands, if you call out, if you raise your voice, if you seek me, you will find the knowledge of God. In verse 10, when wisdom comes into your heart, it will be pleasant to your soul. Protection, pleasure, and obviously you know I had to start the last one with a P. Um, no. The last one is the most compelling benefit of wisdom to me, and it is permanence. It's what every single one of us wants is to stay here. I don't want to die. It's why we stress out about getting sick. It's why we work so hard to retire, if that's your thing. We want to stay here. We want to enjoy our lives. We don't want it taken away from us. Well, look at the last two verses of the chapter. Verse 21, for the upright will inhabit the land, and those with integrity will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land, and the treacherous will be rooted out of it. You see this analogy of trees saying that, that there are people who are going to remain. They're going to continue to bear fruit. They're going to, the metamorphosis isn't just in this life. It's going to go on after this life. Butterflies. I hope I can fly. Anybody ever want to fly? I think that'd be cool. But he says there's also going to be people who will be cut off who will be uprooted. And if you want to bring Jesus into it, who will be thrown into the fire and burn? Now, I know that's heavy. I don't like saying that, but that's what the Bible says. Every single one of us wants permanence. The reality is that only those who embrace God and his pattern for life and his son Jesus will remain, will, will experience security and protection and satisfaction and longevity. That's sobering, but the best news is that God tells us how to remain. Yay, right? <laughs> he tells us how to remain, how to know his protection, how to know the pleasure that only he can give you, how to experience permanence that comes from embracing his pattern for life. And this is what makes wisdom so attractive. It is literally the antidote to death. Last week, we closed with this question, where do you need wisdom? I think that's a question we could ask every single week, every day, every moment. What is one area that you need wisdom? And I was preparing this week, I couldn't help but think of James 1 verse 5. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, 
Let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach or without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Meaning God doesn't look at your past mistakes. Anybody excited about that? He doesn't look at how you've dealt with your situations in the past to determine whether or not you deserve wisdom. None of that. He says, I'm not even going to look at your track record. I'm just going to give generously if you'll ask. But here's the other thing. Asking, as we just saw, is part of the progression toward proactiveness. It's not just once in a while, like I'm just going about my life in the pattern of the world and I say, oh, God, I need wisdom, you know. It represents a direction, a mindset. I'm moving toward God. I trust that he's the only one with the answer to my problem. And he says, if you ask, if you pursue me, I am here and I will give you what you need. So where do you need wisdom? And here's where I want to finish for today. I want to push a little further with a second question. What is one step that you need to take to be more proactive? Because that's what this is about. How do I get wisdom? And, and what I love about this as a progression is that sometimes in my mind, I think of two groups of people. There's the, you know, really lazy, I don't care about wisdom. And then there's the really spiritual wise people. And this progression blows that theory up, that we all live somewhere between <laughs> those two opposites. Some of us are, are listening and we're saying, hey, I'm here, I showed up, don't ask any more of me right now. And that's okay right now because that's part of the progression. We're all over there. And so really the question is asking ourselves, where am I on that spectrum? And I would just throw out a few options to help us think about this. Maybe um, you are all ears, but there's nothing going on in your heart. That's something to talk to God about. God, I'm listening, I'm learning. I just, I go back to the old pattern because that has the most value to me. Maybe your heart is in it. And you're like, yes, right on, woohoo! But your life isn't showing the fruit on Monday morning or Tuesday morning. Maybe you're reading your Bible and you're kind of in a rut and you get up and you read and you, you know, what about listening to the Bible? <laughs> what about get your ears involved? Or, or what about get your hand involved? Write a little verse on a note card from your daily reading and put it in your car or something to think about or type it in your phone. In other words, involve more of yourself. It's just a thought. What about uh, maybe you're comfortable coming on Sunday mornings, but you don't know any of your neighbor's names? Ouch. That one hurts me so bad, truly. What about involving your feet and walking over sometime this week and just introducing yourself? More of our bodies in our faith, in, our, in the pursuit of God, in the pursuit of wisdom. The point is we all need to grow. I need to grow. I can give you my answers to these questions. It's seeking God for his wisdom and knowing what is that next step for me. Well, I want to invite our worship team forward to say one more thing. It's possible when I ask, where do you need to grow? Where do you need wisdom? Maybe you're like, I just, I can't think of anything right now. And I would say that's okay. That's okay. But I also have good news. Next week, we're going to talk about conflict. And then we're going to talk about relationships and finances and justice and contentment. So if you don't have anything now, you will. <laughs> and that's the point of this, um, because these topics that we're going to be addressing, which make up the content of the Proverbs, are, I believe, by God's design, the areas of greatest felt need in our human experience. I think there's a reason we see what we see in the Proverbs is God has boiled it down and said, this is the most common stuff that people experience. And here's the thing. If we can lean into those moments, because I know it's really uncomfortable to face our weaknesses and to say, I need to grow here. It's way easier to pretend we don't have any weaknesses or to just distract ourselves. But listen, those moments of felt need are what catapult us forward on the progression toward proactiveness. Does that make sense? So when you find yourself desperate and you say, I don't know any way to fix my marriage, it moves you forward. God knows that. He's designed it that way. When you say, I don't have any way to stop this pattern in my life that is destructive, it forces you to your knees. It forces you to go from listening to caring to calling out to, I need help. And what does God say if you move forward in that progression? You will understand the knowledge of God. You will find wisdom for your soul. It'll be satisfying. 
So I just want to encourage us to allow God to do his work, to not pull away or, or wince when we feel pain, but to be honest and vulnerable and press into what he wants to do in our lives. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word, which is so clear and lays out for us so clearly, God, your heart for us to be transformed as our minds are renewed, as we encounter a better way of life than what our world can offer. Lord, would you bring about metamorphosis in each heart today? Those in this room, those watching online, that you would bring even just incremental change that we could say that's different now because of God and because of his word. God, I pray you'd give us wisdom. We ask for wisdom. We ask for wisdom knowing you give generously without finding fault without reproach. Give us wisdom where we need God and I pray you just reveal one step for every person listening to become more proactive in our pursuit of you and our pursuit of your wisdom. In Jesus' name we pray this, amen.